Hello, and welcome to the National Secular Society podcast. I'm Emma Park, and this week I'll be joined by Chris Sloggett and Megan Manson to talk about the place of Remembrance Sunday in modern Britain. In particular, we will discuss whether the Church of England should still be entitled to play a leading role in the ceremony, or if not, what should be done instead. Next, I'll be joined by Keith Porteous Wood, the President and former Executive Director of the NSS. Keith will be giving us an update on the NSS's activities elsewhere in Europe and in the UN. He will be focusing on the child abuse scandals that continue to afflict the Catholic Church around the world, as well as the Church of England. In his memorable poem, Dulce et Decorum Est, the World War I poet Wilfred Owen described the horrors of trench warfare and how he witnessed the shocking death of one of his comrades in a gas attack. The Latin title of the poem is taken from lines by Horace that exalted patriotism in the Roman Empire and means, it is a fine and proper thing to die for your fatherland. Owen used these words ironically to question the morality of the country that had sent him and his comrades out to suffer and die. If you had seen the man who was drowning in poisonous gas, Owen says, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to young men ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. Owen himself died in combat a week before Armistice Day on the 11th of November 1918. His poetry and death have become symbols of the appalling waste of life in the war to end all wars, a conflict that was both unnecessary and that paved the way for the even more barbaric atrocities of World War II. The UK commemorates the two world wars and subsequent conflicts on Remembrance Day itself, through a two-minute silence, and at greater length, on Remembrance Sunday, the second Sunday in November. Megan, let's focus on the National Ceremony of Remembrance held at the Cenotaph in Whitehall on Remembrance Sunday. What, in the NSS's view, is wrong with having a service of remembrance led by the C of E as part of this ceremony? Well, the problem we have is that this should be a national event that should hold deep significance for all people of all faiths and none in the UK. And these ceremonies include exclusively Christian rituals and hymns. Um, A bishop leads a procession with a cross borne at the front. And uh, the bishop also leads in Christian prayers. Um, The order of service at the Cenotaph was introduced in 1921, and it really hasn't changed since. And so the issue we have is the the prominence of religion at what should be a very inclusive event, um, and particularly the prominence of the Church of England dominating it. Going back to this point that the service of remembrance was introduced in 1921 at the Cenotaph, the name Cenotaph actually comes not from the Christian tradition at all, but from an ancient Greek word meaning empty tomb. So, Megan, who designed the one in Whitehall, and did they intend it to be specifically a Christian monument? Well, this is the really ironic thing, is that it was designed specifically to be non-religious, because the war dead were from such a diverse array of people from different backgrounds and beliefs. The Church of England had wanted originally to put a Christian cross on the top or put Christian inscriptions on it. Uh, The government wisely said no. So having religious rituals taking place at the Cenotaph really does take something away from the original vision of the architect, who was uh, Edwin Lutyens. Um, which was to have a secular monument that could truly represent all. I think if you were to see how Christian the ceremonies at the Cenotaph are today, I think you'd be disappointed to say the least. How does the Church of England then justify its ongoing role or how would it do so if pressed? I think the Church of England's response would probably be that because it is our established church, or to put it another way, our state religion, it naturally falls upon them to lead services such as this. Uh, The church is also fond of claiming that it's able to represent all people of all faiths and beliefs in its capacity as the established church, and this would include its high-profile role at Remembrance Sunday. And what's the NSS's response to the C of E's position? Well, naturally, we challenge the very legitimacy of the Church of England as the established church. Uh, We don't think there should be any established religion or belief because this gives an obvious unfair privilege to the institutions of that particular faith. And moreover, the Church of England increasingly represents a dwindling minority group. 
Uh, the latest uh, British Social Attitude Survey found that just 12% of Brits identify as C of E. And according to the C of E's own statistics published just last month, only 1.5% of the population attended church in an average week in October last year. And furthermore, we know that over half the population has no religion at all. So for these reasons, we think there's no way the C of E can be truly representative of the majority of people in this country. And it's for all these same reasons we object to the Church of England's dominance at the services at the Cenotaph. It's giving an unfair spotlight to the Church of England, and it fails to represent us as a nation of diverse believers and non-believers alike. And what about future generations? Chris, as a former history teacher, do you think that having the C of E leading the Remembrance Service might be alienating to today's students? Uh, yes, I think it can be. Um, when so few young people are Anglican, there's the risk that they just tune out of Anglican services. Um, it's, so this isn't just about representation. It's also about ensuring people continue to remember what happened during the World Wars and since. Um, and remembrance can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, some people are obviously very, very keen to keep the focus on the sacrifices that were made by the soldiers and saying thank you. Some people may want to shift slightly more towards uh, thinking about how we can avoid such slaughter in the future. Um, and I think the, the point is that what, what unites these, the, these positions is that you want to remember what happened. Um, if we're going to remember what happened, then we may just need to update the service to make it just frankly more relevant. Megan, what is the NSS doing to update or change the Remembrance Day ceremony to a secular one? And how much progress has it made so far? This has mainly been a campaign of awareness raising. So what we're really asking is for people to critically examine the role of the church in Remembrance Sunday. I want people to ask, why do we give this increasingly irrelevant and divisive institution the centre stage for an occasion of national importance? What would be a better way of representing the fallen of other faiths and no faith equally? The answer so far has simply been to include more representatives of religion and belief groups in the proceedings. Uh, last year, I believe, for the first time, they even included a humanist representative. But that leads us to ask ourselves, is this truly what representation means? Um, do most people who have no belief really feel that humanists represent them? For many people, religion and belief is a very personal matter, and even those who are not religious don't necessarily feel that their designated leaders honestly represent them. So perhaps there's a problem then with having representatives of particular religious groups and even non-religious ones at all. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, uh, we're wary of the multi-faithist approach to changing the ceremony. Um, it's similar to the approach to the House of Lords, which some religious apologists advance. Uh, people say that we should bring in more representatives of different religious groups and that that will make things more representative. But really what you're doing is just appointing a new class of elites. And remembrance really should be for all citizens. So how can a remembrance ceremony be conducted in a way that does include all citizens? Megan, is there anything we can learn from other countries that still mark Remembrance Day? Oh, definitely. Um, you look at uh, countries that have, that have far more strict separation of church and state uh, than we do. So, for example, like France. Uh, these countries demonstrate again and again that it's possible to have a deeply meaningful and poignant um, remembrance service. So it's kind of ironic that to get an idea of how we can better represent people in our own nation, we'd probably do well to look at examples from other nations. Finally, what can NSS members do if they feel strongly about this issue? Well, like so many issues, this all relates to the established status of the Church of England. Um, as long as we have an established church, that church is going to be put at the centre of many national events like Remembrance Day. Uh, and the key to ending this privilege is disestablishment. So I would first and foremost encourage listeners to support our disestablishment campaign. Uh, you can sign our petition for disestablishment on our website. And if you feel particularly strongly about this specific issue of Remembrance Day, uh, you can write to your MP asking them to raise the issue of making it more inclusive uh, to the ministers responsible. Chris, anything to add? Well, I suppose... Uh People listening and, and you know, NSS supporters and members will probably have uh, a range of views about what a, set, what a remembrance service might include. Um, and hopefully this discussion will just prompt uh, some various thoughts on, on that subject. 
Um, it's also just worth, uh, you know, as a communications officer, it would be remiss of me not to just put a little plug in for a really good blog that's on our website um, by the historian Dan Snow, uh, written a few years ago. I mean, and his argument was similar to the one I was advancing earlier, actually. He was, he was essentially saying that it's very important to remember what happened, um, but then that the service needs to be updated to make sure that remembrance is passed on through the generations. Megan and Chris, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. While the NSS's focus is on secularism in the UK, it also takes an interest in international campaigns to support secularism and challenge religious privilege. One area where this is particularly important is in international efforts to tackle child abuse in the Catholic Church and other denominations of Christianity. Clerical abuse in the Catholic Church has become a scandal around the world. I'm joined now by Keith Porteous Wood, president of the NSS, to tell us more. Keith, just to be clear, what do we mean by clerical abuse? Clerical abuse is the abuse of minors and vulnerable adults by clerics uh, and those in contact with children and vulnerable adults by virtue of them being connected with the church. Why has the NSS become involved in the issue of child abuse by the Christian clergy? We work on clerical abuse because of its enormous scale and because of the religious bodies going to huge lengths to hide it. We're motivated by aim to protect uh, survivors and victims. They prefer to be called survivors often. We aim to encourage proper compensation and rehabilitation for the victims and survivors. And above all, to bring alleged perpetrators to justice. Because of the huge power uh, and immense wealth uh, of religious organizations, they can get away with a great deal. And we seek to expose this. Not many other people do. We don't restrict our work uh, on clerical review re abuse to the Roman Catholic Church, however, but uh, because of the, the scale of the known abuse, both nationally and internationally in the Roman Catholic Church, it's an obvious focus. You've been following the progress that the Catholic Church has made or failed to make to eradicate child abuse by its clergy. Could you give us an update on the most important developments in recent months? Well, the last year has been a dreadful one for the Catholic Church. The Pope was publicly humiliated in Ireland by its Prime Minister for offering no concrete action on clerical abuse. Francis just reiterated another weary and meaningless apology. And earlier this month, he was also personally criticised by the Independent Inquiry on Sexual Abuse in England and Wales for the Vatican's failure to assist in that inquiry. Uh, despite criticisms by the UN twice for the Vatican's failure to assist similar inquiries. Two further significant events this year have been that two cardinals became convicts. They were convicted of criminal uh, offences relating to clerical abuse. That was uh, Cardinal Pell in Australia for abuse and Cardinal Barbara in France for failure to disclose abuse. Both have appealed. In this year alone, appalling outcomes have been publicised of inquiries in Germany, France, and also here in England and Wales. That inquiry found, for example, that wholesale abuse had occurred in open sight in a prestigious Roman Catholic school in Ealing, West London, for 60 continuous years. The inquiry concluded that, and I quote, children could have been saved from the abuse if the church had not been so determined to protect its own reputation above all else, unquote. This was a direct criticism of the personal actions of the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, Vincent Nichols, who is the most senior cleric in England and Wales. And I've just heard that news is emerging from the Scottish inquiry of widespread shocking abuse 
there. This is all uh, in residential schools, uh, which unfortunately was the sole focus of the inquiry there. Do you think the um, inquiry should have also focused on non-residential schools? Well, yes, and, and, and as the England and Wales one did, uh, even more widely, the internet and institutional uh, abuse, sexual abuse of all kinds, and it goes much, far further than schools. And the opening shots of the next abuse crisis have already been fired this year. The abuse of one of nuns worldwide. Are we going to see more about that crisis in the near future? I'm sure we will, and similarly, abuse in the developing world. It's not unknown for recalcitrant and incorrigible priests who've been abusing habitually in the uh, Western world to be sent to the developing world where they're uh, not out of harm's way, but uh, where they, uh, their activities will not uh, attract publicity. How has the NSS's campaign against clerical abuse developed over the years, and how much success have you had so far? Our campaign, Emma, was born out of the growing revelations about Roman Catholic abuse on a spectacular scale, initially in Ireland and the United States, where with the church was doing everything it could to cover up and avoid paying compensation. Sadly, such revelations almost no, are no longer news. Our light bulb moment w was the realization that uh, the Vatican, Europe's last absolute monarchy and smallest state, had ratified the UN Convention for the Rights of the Child under its diplomatic nom de plume, the Holy See, and that it was woefully in breach of its convention obligations. Just to clarify, what are the most important of those obligations? It's a long convention uh, with many articles, but the tenor of it, as you would expect, was that member states have the obligation to do their absolute utmost to work in the best interests of, of children. And also there's an administrative requirement, which is that they must report on their success and challenges in following the convention uh, every five years and submit this to the UN Committee for the Rights of the Child. The Vatican, or the Holy See, had failed to do this and was something like 14 years overdue uh, with that, which prevented uh, the committee from examining the Holy See's record uh, in this respect, which was widely known to be appalling. And when you realised that the Holy See was in such breach of its convention obligations, how did this help your campaign? Well, this meant that we could go to the UN Human Rights Council and point out, as we did on several occasions, uh, that the Holy See was very much in breach of, of its convention obligations. In fact, we cited several articles, not just the one about reporting, which the Vatican was in breach of. Um, and shortly afterwards, Geoffrey Robertson QC wrote a, a magnificent book called The Case of the Pope, which cited these same articles pretty well that he, in his uh, great international experience, also thought that the Holy See was in breach of. So we then were able to give evidence uh, to the Committee for the Rights of the Child when the Vatican crumbled and produced its report. Um, and as a result of that, the committee produced a extremely critical report running to something like 70 paragraphs which uh, drew international uh, publicity on, on a massive scale. So that was a huge uh, second victory really. You've mentioned that the Vatican is a sovereign state under the name the Holy See. Does this cause any problems for campaigners on the clerical abuse issue? I mentioned Geoffrey Robertson earlier, the uh, 
illustrious international lawyer with uh, close links to the United Nations, he actually maintains under the Montevideo Convention that the, the Vatican doesn't actually qualify as being a nation for reasons of tact. Um, I'm not going to comment about that, but I will say that it has become a state in a sense because a lot of other nations have recognized it. So it's become a de facto state, albeit that there are debates about uh, the, the very strange nature of uh, that it is, of not just its size, but uh, the nature of the population and various other uh, elements. Um, it, its origin it was very much through the Lateran Treaty and, and uh, Mussolini played a part in it somewhere. Um, but the more practical issue for us of it being a sovereign state uh, is that it is able to have documents held secretly to which no one else has access. And this is rather taken advantage of because popes have said all material relating to clerical abuse must be sent to the Vatican. Um, and therefore it's out of reach of, for example, European West arrest warrants and, and that kind of uh, similar uh, procedures for, uh, uh, for, for discovery. And so uh, the, the Vatican often uses diplomatic immunity to evade providing information for inquiries and courts and in cases of abuse and even for providing uh, personnel to take part in, in trials. And we've seen all of these. And it is a major problem. And it's a problem that for, for which it's been very much criticised by the UN and indeed by the independent uh, inquiry in England and Wales. Uh, so uh, we uh, need to, to challenge that at every opportunity. Uh, and it is it is a significant problem. Do you ever see the Catholic Church changing its ways? Well, I'll let your listeners draw their own conclusions from what I'm about to say. The Pope's record on confronting abuse is abysmal. It's just repeated meaningless apologies and initiatives designed to catch the headlines but fail in practice. Under his watch... The Vatican completely rejected the UN Committees for the Rights of the Child criticisms and suggestions. Uh, he even refuses to direct the worldwide church to bring suspected perpetrators to justice and compensate victims. And these victims' lives have been absolutely ruined by the abuse. Moving closer to home, the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, Vincent Nichols, record is no better. He was singled out recently by the England and Wales Abuse Inquiry for the most harsh criticism. What happens if the Catholic Church doesn't change? What can secularists do then? Well, we have to a degree tried to work with some of the more positive people in the church to train to challenge this heartless intransigence. Uh, and some baby steps have been made, but we really can't rely on the church's goodwill, which in any case is in very short supply. The greatest driver of change um, will have to be forced on the church from um, legislative changes, such as introduction of manager reporting of institutional abuse, and similarly uh, by changes in the courts to force more cooperation from the Catholic Church. And we're actively working on both fronts. Turning now to the Church of England, how far have there been similar abuse scandals and what are the latest developments? Well, the uh, Anglican Church was a, a further segment of the uh, inquiry hearings of the independent uh, child sexual abuse inquiry. Um, and in July, the Archbishop of Canterbury said, uh, after a toe-curlingly dreadful week, he was, quote, emphatically ashamed, unquote, of the church with regard to saving and that I hope God will forgive us. 
So while the scale of abuse is smaller than in the Roman Catholic Church, there are the same problems of endemic institutional cover-up by the clerical and lay hierarchy. Similarly, the compounding of victims' abuse by disingenuous denials and evading paying appropriate compensation. What about in other Christian denominations and in other religions in the UK? Is there evidence of abuse there? Emma, I'm glad you asked that because it's so often overlooked and we were among others uh, who told the independent inquiry that we'd seen enough evidence to make a convincing case that such abuse was likely to be a significant problem in other denominations such as Jehovah's Witness plus Islam, Judaism and other minority religions. And I'm pleased to say that uh, the Independent Inquiry has recently announced an inquiry into these aspects, albeit we fear on a rather modest scale. Clearly, abuse doesn't just happen in religious organisations, but do they seem to be especially prone to it? And if so, why? There's hardly a Western nation that hasn't acknowledged a widespread problem uh, of clerical abuse. I, the independent inquiry actually asked me that very same question that you have. And, and a summary of my answer is that the spiritual power of those in authority over children um, in often remote or isolated secretive institutions, uh, the huge influence of clerics uh, over the police and local authorities and parents to disbelieve complainants, and the need to protect institutions from scandal at any cost. All this serves to allow uh, abuse to continue unabated for a long time, but it also serves as a magnet for potential abusers to join such institutions. What's the future outlook for the existence of the abuse of minors within the Church of England and other religious organisations in the UK and abroad? The, the best hope is for more and more publicity and for a reduction of deference, which I think is happening, and the introduction of the safeguarding measures uh, in law. Uh, and I think these would all help to some degree. However, we won't know for decades because, shockingly, it takes over 30 years on average for an abuse victim to claim. A major concern is that the necessary cultural improvement um, in church hierarchies in particular has been glacial and that there's almost none in the smaller denominations and other minority religions. It therefore falls to governments to rapidly re legislate to introduce mandatory reporting where it isn't there, as it isn't in the UK, and to remove obstacles such as time bars to criminal and civil prosecutions of suspected perpetrators. And none of this will happen without sustained pressure from inquiries and survivors and victims and campaigners such as ourselves and Mandate Now, which is a marvellous organisation pressing for mandatory reporting, and for the Vatican to follow its treaty obligations under the UN Convention. So what can NSS members who feel strongly about this issue do to support the NSS's campaign? Where members do become uh, aware of abuse, and particularly in clerical situations, and particularly if it appears not to, being, uh, to be appropriately dealt with, they're welcome to contact us and we will seek uh, to step in. But also, um, uh, on a more practical level, I think, and, and wide, with widespread benefit, would be to write to their MPs to support the introduction of mandatory reporting of institutional abuse. It's important that we say institutional abuse because there, there is criticism of a kind of tell everybody, a snitching on everybody kind of provision, which would, I think, be um, go down very badly in British law. As it happens, 
there is a requirement already in Northern Ireland that goes back to the Troubles to report any criminal offence committed by anyone else that is observed. But that was based really in an extreme time and I don't know how much it is uh, followed in practice. However, there is widespread uh, acceptance that an obligation to report abuse in institutional situations such as schools and, and, and religious situations, and I would add to that uh, uh, sports uh, scenarios, is something that the England and Wales and Scotland are behind much of the rest of the world in f having so far failed to do and put in their legislation. And so I invite anyone who has been touched by what I've said to write to their MP asking for mandatory reporting of abuse in institutional situations to be brought into UK law uh, as soon as possible. And that's what the independent inquiry has been asked time and time again to do. Keith Potiuswood, thank you very much. Pleasure. That was episode 18 of the National Secular Society podcast, hosted by Emma Park. If you would like to help us challenge religious privilege and support freedom of and from religion in Britain today, why not become a member of the NSS? Full details are on our website at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you like this podcast, you can find more episodes on the website, along with further information about the topics discussed. Thanks for listening.